This conference will now be recorded. Uh, yes, this is Srikant. Yeah. Uh, I'm working as a BA developer, but uh, coming to DevOps and AWS, I don't have any knowledge. Okay, Srikant. Anyone else? This is Lakshma. I have mainframe and uh, other uh, languages experience, but uh, not the. Heard this about... conference will now be recorded. You might have already heard about how a particular software is developing through SDLC lifecycle management. Okay. So, anyone here from non IT who doesn't understand what is an SDLC is? So, everyone is from IT background, right? Like computer science, they understand what is an SDLC. So, simple. So, basically, whenever you have a project, okay, how are you going to develop that project? Okay. And being a software project, it's called software development lifecycle. Okay. So, what is software development lifecycle is there are various phases of software development that you will be able to do before you finally arrive at your end product. Okay. Let's say <clears throat> software can be in multiple ways that can be developed, right? There might be a scenario where you have a client or a customer reaching out to you saying that I need a software for this particular problem. That's one scenario. Another scenario is you have a product that you have developed for in your company for various such clients, like it can be anything like Microsoft or any product that you have developed, which you think will be helpful for so many people. Okay. That's another way. But either way, the development of software process will go through these phases. Okay. So first phase always is, first of all, you need to understand what are the requirements of your particular project. Okay. Once you decide you need to develop a project, you need to understand what are the requirements. A simple thing, you can uh, talk about a particular supermarket project or you can talk about any uh, other advanced project, doesn't matter. Okay. First thing, you need to first understand what are the requirements, like for an end user, how they transact on a daily basis, how we can automate those transactions. That's what matters, right? So first thing always in the SDLC is your requirements phase, where you will collect all the requirements, okay? And I think this is where some of you said BA role uh, they're doing, like PS earlier used to be the key folks where they're actually helpful to collect these requirements and all. Once you collect all the requirements, obviously you need to do a project to design for your project, okay? So you in the design itself, you there will be a lot of high level, low level designs and later object oriented designs came up. So end of the day, you need to design how your project is going to look like. Okay. Finally, you will be able to code that which is nothing but implementation. Okay. So you need development and you will be choosing what are the right language and the tools that you want to develop. What is the right platform and architecture that you want to build on? So you will be choosing that and you will be implementing. That means coding your project. Okay. And after coding, you cannot directly deliver it into production. So you definitely need uh, testing of the entire product or project. So you need verification basically, which is nothing but your testing. Okay. So after the testing and even the testing, there will be multiple levels of testing, various phases of testing. Okay. If you have gone through these testing life cycles and testing phases, you will be uh, understanding that. All. So even DevOps will go through a few of those testings, of course. So verification is important. After all the testings are done, now the product is ready. Okay. Then you will actually deploy it into production. Okay. Any software product. Okay. And finally, that will be into maintenance. Okay. That means it will be into production. Any issues that will happen in production, okay, will be taken care by uh, your incident management group or production assurance group like that. Okay. So these are all the typical phases of any software development from requirements to maintenance. So now, what is the major difference DevOps can make in the development of software is what we are going to talk about. Okay. So traditionally, if you look at the software development, we used to have something called a waterfall methodology. Okay. So waterfall methodology is like this, whatever the diagram you are seeing, okay, is like this where you can actually complete 
one step at a time like right from the requirements okay uh, to one second or let me just uh, So look at this diagram <coughs> um, this will be even <coughs> better okay so what you are actually going to do in this waterfall methodology this is the traditional way of developing a software okay so the traditional way of developing a software is always like you need to first complete one phase and then only you can go to the next phase so first complete all the requirements then start the designing and then complete all the designing then only start the coding like that you will be doing one phase at a time so the disadvantage of this particular model okay the advantage is also there of course the advantage of this model is basically you will be having um, uh, a lot of uh, clear clarity on the requirements clarity on the design without any back and forth okay for either developers or testers okay if you follow waterfall model okay but the disadvantage of waterfall model is each phase is going to take a lot of time okay so let's say for a typical project if each phase is going to take six months then you are going to spend at least two years before the customer sees something as an output and in two years in the current changing dynamics a lot of businesses will change a simple typical example uh, we can talk about is let's say you have a telecom provider okay or I, we can talk about uh, the airtel and geo competition the moment geo came into picture they announced hundreds of offers a lot of low prices okay and they are trying uh, to basically grab the entire market if competitors like airtel and others are not ready to make a change in the software for their own software let's say airtel can also come and then say okay i am also reducing the price or i am also introducing these new features or new offers they can announce but they can they make those features and changes so fast that they can actually handle the competition that's where the importance of actually devops and some of these faster delivery of software okay is coming into picture helping the business also okay that's one of the examples how waterfall is actually going to have some problems if you follow the waterfall because if you follow the waterfall you need to go one at a time okay and you cannot deliver faster but it will be a strong clarity and everything will be there that's a different story so the reason why waterfall is not getting used regularly is because we are not able to deliver faster to business that's one of the challenges that we traditionally have with waterfall okay so after that what happened is some of the consulting companies came up with this model called spiral model okay of course there are a lot of models i am not going to discuss all the models of uh, software development we are going to discuss some key models which changed the way of working actually so we just talked about waterfall model we are going to talk about spiral and then we'll get into agile okay. the spiral model is basically so you have <clears throat> you have a bigger project okay so in this bigger project what you can do is you can divide this particular project into multiple modules okay so let's say you have a larger project okay and you have a module that talks about a particular feature and functionality you have a different module that talks about a different feature and functionality you can release one particular major functionality or a major module at a time so usually you might have seen in your academic projects also i'm working on this module i'm working on that module so but all these modules need to be integrated at the end okay so simple example is like let's say you ordered for a car okay you are get, not getting the entire car at once okay but you are getting one piece at a time but you still need to wait till the end when all these pieces are assembled but customer is getting some feeler that okay there's something getting delivered either it is usable or not usable but i am able to see some something is getting delivered for the amount of time and money i have spent so spy model simply divides your entire project into multiple modules and they will start collecting requirements design and everything for each module so then what happens is instead of waiting for two years for your whole project you can see some output one of the module getting delivered within six months 
So that is an advantage. At least customer is able to see something delivered in six months. So that's the advantage. And if the spiral continues, the circle continues. So requirements, design, maintenance, okay, like this. So you have requirements, design, maintenance, and uh, like this, it will continue for every module till you complete the last module, okay. So you're able to see, the customer is able to see something, okay, is getting delivered, but it may not be the final uh, end product sometimes, and you need to wait till you get it, all these pieces assembled. So the advantage here is customer is able to see something in shorter period of time rather than two years the customer is able to see in six weeks or six months but the disadvantage still is okay still you're not able to see the end to end product okay or the completed product till two years it's still taking two years okay so that's uh, the spiral model but a lot of uh, consulting companies uh, were actually successful in uh, doing this spiral and then modularized development okay which is uh, really a lot of customers also now you would have already heard about agile right so agile is the fastest way of development so far okay right and there are various methods in between like rapid application development rad and all these things also but agile is more structured and the recent development methodologies that we are using okay so in agile what's going to happen is so the faces are definitely not going to change okay so only thing that's going to change is earlier we divided that into modules okay now we are dividing them into sprints and one of the major differences okay between agile and any other methodologies okay that uh, we are uh, doing is even if it is a small sprint a sprint is usually stands for two to four weeks that means you need to deliver something to the customer in two to four weeks so two to four weeks you need to do the requirements you need to do any design changes if there are you need to do uh, coding and testing okay. finally you will be able to push that into production okay only after like two to four within two to four weeks there are some companies that will uh, that are able to do it in two weeks some companies follow the four week sprint also okay so in a sprint you are supposed to deliver something but one of the key elements here is let's go back to the car example okay so in the previous models we said okay even though customer is getting something he's getting engine at a time like uh, tires at another time the uh, entire the chassis at another time and finally you need to wait till the end of the project to assemble all these things together that means the final usable product you still need to wait for two years but what agile is saying is every sprint you need to deliver something to the customer that is usable so if you understand this entire car, car concept in the agile perspective first of all don't deliver a car in the first sprint deliver a small bicycle okay next sprint upgrade that to a bike next sprint put two more tires as a mini car okay like that improve every sprint the model that you are working on okay so that is what is agile. That means even in the first sprint itself, you are able to use some code which is workable, basically some benefit you are getting, uh, giving to the customer. Okay. So your design and your agile methodologies, you need to actually change it in like that. So whenever you define an agile backlog, that's what is uh, called basically list of items that you need to develop. You need to prioritize those backlogs in such a way and also you need to give it to the sprint in such a way that if i develop this particular item in the sprint is it going to be working on its own or independently is it workable okay so you need to develop something which is independently is going to work without any other backlog items that you still need to develop okay so that's the key motto in agile development so these are the development methodologies and things are changing because of this okay why we need to get into development of agile why why can't we still follow waterfall is because of the business demand okay so earlier all the software development is focused more on the structure and methodology driven is what we used to follow okay so when we used to follow waterfall that is completely methodology driven that means any software this is the way you need to develop and they don't care about what customer thinks they don't care about what the business impact would be okay 
but now the complete focus got shifted from models to the customer or the business so if a business is getting benefited by delivering your software faster then you need to definitely focus on that one i have given an earlier telecom example right okay so if airtel can actually make changes to their software and able to deliver it to production within a short period of time it can be a week or it can be a day or it can be two days then you can still hold the competition but if it is going to take six months to deliver a feature which their competitor has just announced then in the six months you can imagine how many customers will shift from this company to other company so that's a huge impact of business if you don't follow this agile methodologies or any any methodology that will actually be able to help get the features faster to the customer okay so now okay agile has a very good beautiful uh, uh, methodology okay it says you need to deliver uh, in two to four weeks and uh, you are um, um, able to deliver something which can independently work that's the motto right but how can we make it possible so how can we make sure that all these things are done faster if we follow the traditional way of siloed team management okay so in fact i think change the way teams work also right the siloed teams management is basically there is a requirements team which will collect the requirements they will prepare a requirements document and they will just hand it over to the design team same design team will work on the design they will give a beautiful design and they will just say development team this is your design go code according to this design same once the development is done what happens development will uh, do uh, basically hand over that to the testing team basically deploy it and of course there will be some back and forth between testing and development finally the end product they will actually put it on the production support team they will give it to production support they will just put it into production and they will just move out so it's just basically pushing a package over the wall right it's not technically working as one team to, together okay and uh, they they never used to work together as one team actually it's just one after another and that's not going to give you enough time to really develop and also it will not uh, be giving you an opportunity how is some of the things you can solve collaboratively okay that's the disadvantage but agile in agile methodologies if you understand how the team uh, is actually going to be in an agile agile doesn't look at all these things are different so you will have smaller teams okay which we call it as scrum teams in a scrum teams there will be a uh, developer there will be a tester there will be a requirements engineer there will be a designer okay except production support okay production support still not there okay so all these things will be all these people will be there in one team which we call it as a scrum team now again the scrum team again designed a full package and they're throwing to the production support teams the entire package the key thing here is devops is actually the one that is a bridge between your production and your hl teams so how it is going to make a bridge okay is it is going to help enable or automate all the manual points in your development life cycle okay so all the points in the sense let's say developer developed the code okay so once that code is developed okay the traditional way is they used to give a particular uh, either an individual in their team or a dedicated build engineer or a dedicated scm engineer okay in their group to develop that package okay and to basically build the package and it's on that particular person's responsibility to deploy that into test environment verify all the testing and everything okay and then finally if the testing everything is okay deploy it to production okay and for production will take care all these are actually manual step which used to take from hours to days sometimes months also because the back and forth process now through devops if we can automate all these steps then we can actually achieve that speed of delivery okay from months to now couple of weeks okay so what devops is going to do is devops is actually going to help automate all these steps especially after building your code okay so it's not going to automate 
your requirements engineering and your design that is still the agile team's responsibility okay and usually in agile methodology if you are delivering only small feature you will not focus too much on the requirements and uh, uh, design okay so it's directly coding majority of the times so once the coding is done from there till it gets to production and even after getting into production if there are issues in production the entire life cycle is basically okay automated through some of the devops tools okay so if you look at how devops is uh, going to be uh, work okay simple thing from the moment the code is developed okay the devops team is going to pick up okay and the devops team is actually going to automate the entire uh, so if yeah this is actually one simple example okay you can look at so basically you have your coding testing and all these things right okay basically so the devops team is going to automate all these steps if you can look at these steps okay you have planning you have coding you have build you have testing after that you need to release which is to production and after this basically a deployment okay nothing but uh, uh, to your containers or anything and operate which is nothing but production management and if they have any issues obviously you will get to know through your monitoring okay and you will be able to again get that issues anything from the monitoring back to your planning session so this is called devops life cycle basically okay so you can see how many tools that we can use in uh, uh, devops okay and uh, so there is another representation of devops also basically if you look at the, the term devops came up because it's an integrated part between development and operations operations is nothing but production support okay so if you look at all these things all these steps are again part of sdlc right okay be it uh, building the code which is packaging the code after uh, developing the code and testing the code okay and also deploying that code into production okay and production operations all these are actually uh, key elements of sdlc which are taking definitely a lot of time in any uh, model be it a waterfall model or spiral model any other model actually okay so if you have earlier in the traditional development methodology the waterfall model you will be de delivering a project once in two years then you don't need hardly a dedicated devops engineer because that person will have work only at the end of the project okay so there used to be no devops roles if you look at the waterfall model spiral model really demanded some roles okay then they started putting a devops dedicated or a build engineer even though they don't call it as devops but they used to have a role called build engineer where build engineer's primary responsibility is take all the code that is developed write some build scripts like be it an ant or maven or anything create the package and go deploy the package into various environments one at a time first do the sit environment next uat environment and finally production environment so that really demanded a role for devops okay that means there is one person for all the projects can take care of it once in six months or so but in agile you need this build you need this deployment every two weeks two to four weeks is your sprint right for every project you need a build once okay and deployment can be three to four times because you need to do test environment deployment and finally one production deployments in one sprint you need at least three to four deployments and one build five different activities can one person handle this no and you will not have only one project in a scenario right you will have hundreds of projects so then the demand for devops engineers has actually increased so but you they cannot really go and uh, uh, increase the number of build engineers who can do the manual build manual deployment and all this stuff okay so that's when all these tools got evolved in the industry that you can simply automate this entire process okay and all this entire process you have various tools for each phase actually okay right for build you have maven okay for testing you have unit testing okay for uh, um, the coding and all you have git basically your source code and everything you can put it okay for deployment you have the platform be it doc or aws whatever okay so you have all those details here right so but we also need something which integrates all these 
steps and tools together, which we call it as continuous integration and continuous deployment. Okay. So continuous integration is nothing but picking up the code from the moment it got checked in. Check in means once you put, you made up your changes and you say commit so that it will go to the central repository. That's called check in. So the moment you check in the code to the moment you complete all the testing is called continuous integration. And once the testing is completed, you need to give that package to your production, right? You need to take the same package and then do it in the, uh, deploying the production. So that is called continuous deployment. So the term continuous is actually valid when all these steps are happening seamlessly. That means there should not be any manual intervention. There should not be any manual approvals required. So that's the term called continuous integration and continuous deployment. So there will be some confusion between continuous deployment and continuous delivery. So you might have heard these two terms differently, right? So the primary difference between continuous deployment and continuous delivery is continuous deployment doesn't need any gateway approvals to deploy into production. That means even you don't need to stop for any approvals that is required. That's continuous deployment. But you have everything automated, but you need some person to approve in between getting onto the tool and all. That is called continuous delivery. You're delivering it continuously, but not deploying it continuously. Okay. That's the only major difference between continuous delivery and continuous deployment. Okay. Now let's get back to okay, what are the tools that we're going to learn in DevOps course? Okay. So as I, as you see in this particular uh, uh, diagram okay so we are going to learn pretty much these issues so we are not going to focus more on the production space which is like uh, operate space and all but we will be able to touch some of those uh, tools also okay so primarily okay and you can also see some of the different set of tools okay from various areas okay are different uh, aspects right so first of all from a coding perspective I think the best way for all of you to understand the DevOps ecosystem is, okay, you have something called DevOps periodic table, okay. Um, it was actually developed by someone called Zebia Labs and then Digital Lab AI bought them later, okay. So if you have gone through chemistry, your academics, okay, you understand the periodic table, okay. This is a representation of all our DevOps tools into periodic table actually. Okay. So these are all the tools. It's just a minimal set of tools. It's, it's not a complete set of tools, by the way. Okay. These are all the tools that are available in the DevOps ecosystem. Do you need to learn each and every tool? Maybe not. You just need to understand one tool from each of these sections. Okay. If you understand one tool, it's easy for you to get on to any other tool and then start working on it. Okay. It's basically you need to understand how the tool works, what is the tool for. Okay, and what are the internal concepts around that tool? If you understand that, it will be easy. Okay, so let's say you start with the coding, right? So you have your developers completing their code and everything. Okay, then the first thing what they will do is they will actually put all their code into your software configuration management tool, or we can call it as source control management or source code management. Okay, so the first thing that you will be understanding is about Git. So basically, which is a repository of all your software code. Okay. So you need to understand Git primarily, not as an administrator, primarily, how will you put the code? How will you take the code out of it? How will you create various branches? Okay. How will you manage the code developed by multiple developers? And what is that merging concept? How can you integrate that code between two developers? All these concepts you need to learn. So that's the first step. Okay. So once you get the code as a DevOps engineer, you get the code, okay, put it on your local or somewhere on the server, okay. Once you get the code, you need to do something called build, okay. So building in the sense, normally developers will be developing their own piece of code and they will be individually looking at their own piece of code. But when you combine all that code and then build into a package, then only the code will work. And traditionally, uh, like I'm uh, going to use Java as an example because uh, Java is like the more predominant language nowadays. So let's say if you talk about Java, there are three different packages that Java will always give as an output, var, er, and uh, jar file, okay? 
So this one of these files you just need to download. That means you let's say you have a web, web portal that you, that's your project. Okay. So var file is the output. So you are combining all individual develop the code. Okay. You will be compiling them and then um, uh, integrating them as one package. Okay. What we call that process called archive. Okay. So you will be archiving them into a var file, which is web archive, what we call it as. So that is another process. For that also, you definitely need a tool. Okay. So that tool is going to be somewhere in uh, Jenkins. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, not uh, Maven. I am trying to see where the Maven is. Okay. So you have uh, your uh, source code control. Okay, and you have. I'm trying to see where Maven is. Here it is. So technically, Maven is not a continuous integration tool. Of course, you can achieve continuous integration through Maven. Okay. But build and Maven and continuous integration tools, tools are actually integrated. Okay. And in this diagram representation, don't go by completely with this terminology. So in this uh, terminology, or you can put Maven and Gradle, okay, all these tools as a separate build tools. Traditionally, they are build tools basically. So Maven is a build tool. So Maven will help you to basically build the code together and create a package, okay, which is going to be a var jar or er. Okay, good. Once that is done, then what you need to do is you need to test that code, right? Okay. So you need basically some testing tools. Or first of all, what you need is you need a testing environment. So you need a dedicated server where you will be deploying this code. And before deploying this code, where will you deploy this code? Actually, any application, if it needs to run, it need an app server or a web server. Okay, so if it is a var file, it, it definitely need a web server. If it is a, a normal jar or er file, it need an enterprise server or an app server. Actually, so when you are saying you are deploying the code, means you cannot just put a var file in a folder and then it will run. No, it's not going to run. You definitely need a Java virtual machine or an application or a web server to run this particular code. So you definitely need to learn about one of the app or web server. Tomcat is like the regular open source famous one. So we are going to learn about Tomcat as well. Okay. So we will be working on Tomcat. So on top of Tomcat, you're going to put this, but where the Tomcat is going to sit. So we'll be having a dedicated server and we'll install Tomcat on top of it. And on that, we will be installing our code. And that server, based on what testing you are doing, you can give the name. So, for example, if you are doing an integration testing, you can name that this is my integration testing server. If you are doing a user acceptance testing, you can name it as this is my UAT server. Okay. And you are doing production deployment, which will be accessed by your uh, end customers. You can say this is my production server. So, like that, the environments can be named based on what is the purpose of it. Okay. But the um, environment if you look at the, if you compare this uh, servers everything will be similar okay so the code that you deploy will be same the tomcats uh, you will have will be same your operating system will be same so that you will have a consistency in the config as well okay so maven is another thing after that we will learn about tomcat which is basically your uh, app or web server okay and after that you need to do a testing also right so based on what type of testing you are going to do so First of all, you will start with always unit testing, which will be within when you are actually compiling the code itself. Okay, and you can do some functionality testing. You can talk about any of these tools actually. So be it uh, Selenium, okay, or JUnit is basically for unit testing. Okay, there are various tools, and as I mentioned, you can have more tools than what it is mentioned here also. Okay, it's just the representation of this company. That's it. Okay, so testing will be another integral part that you will learn. So you, you need to learn one of these tools and it's basically as I mentioned DevOps you don't need to be a master of all the tools. There are one or two tools you need to be a master like Jenkins for continuous integration. You need to be a master others. You don't need to okay. You need to understand how you integrate that particular tool or product into your overall ecosystem. Okay, so testing is done. Okay, then if you have any databases that you are using in your uh, uh, code then obviously you need to see how you will integrate those databases into your overall uh, continuous integration pipeline okay 
and if you are using cloud for example aws then you need to learn how aws works create an aws instance okay and you can actually leverage the aws instance to deploy your code there that's another uh, thing and in the overall process you will be always using some communication collaboration tools for your communication between your development teams and your uh, production support teams okay these are like normal means like it can be microsoft teams slack or uh, confluence or anything okay but this is not integral to the regular process but general means of communication you can use one of those tools actually and we'll talk about uh, those okay and uh, configuration automation basically configuration in the sense okay uh, you have code and you have config in general any project is a combination of a code and config so what is the difference between code and config is let's say you have written 10 java files all those 10 java files are compiled and combined to a var file but when you deploy a var file you may need to have some additional properties which will help that particular environment to run or uh, the particular project to run on that particular uh, server okay or you may have some extra xml files you may have some extra media files you may have anything so which will help and they will have a value specific to that particular server okay so for example database password okay so database password will be different for your uat and will be different for your production but you cannot go and change the password every time you deploy into production and every time you deploy into UAT. So the way you can do is you just create one config file where it can dynamically pull the password when it deployed to UAT, the UAT password. When it is deployed to production, the production password. That's what is called config management. Okay. And you have tools like Chef Puppet to really help with that configuration management. And there will be scenarios sometimes where you, if it is only a config change, let's say your production database password got expired and your application stopped working one way of uh, fixing this problem is stop the entire application rebuild your code and update the production password in the code deploy it back onto production which is going to take full cycle okay rather than if you have a config management tool you can directly get onto production server change the password for the database and just restart that particular application which will actually help you to less than the downtime of your application that means your customers are going to be impacted if the application is down for so long so you can just have a quick downtime of one or two minutes without disturbing the customers if it is a full deployment what is going to happen is you need to go back and do all the steps again which will probably take multiple hours so that's the major advantage of having a config management tools only but they cannot help you change any code okay this chef puppet and all it's only for config management you cannot change the code if some code is changing definitely you need to go back and then do the full cycle that's a different story okay so config management tool we are going to see uh, one of them on day and another the thing the major uh, important thing is basically there will be other tools like for example security the new concept is now not devops it's devsecops okay so you need to integrate the security also security aspects also okay into your uh, development life cycle so for example recently uh, you might have heard about log4j issue that happened across the world every company got impacted right so that log4j is nothing but a vulnerability okay so vulnerability is basically there is some issue okay uh, in that particular log4j jar file where some hackers can actually get access to your uh, LDAP and they can get access to your all your user database basically, okay, which is really, really uh, high uh, risk area. Okay, so for all the known vulnerabilities, because log4j is not a known vulnerability, it came up all of a sudden, okay, thanks to Alibaba, they discovered it, okay, so it came up all of a sudden and um, now the entire world is aware of there is a log4j vulnerability. Anytime you use log next time, make sure you are not using this version and then you need to use this version. So for all the vulnerabilities that are already uh, we are aware, we will do an open source scanning. Okay, so let's say you have your code, you have developed your code. Let's say yeah, there is a developer, he wanted to build some fancy thing on the UI and he randomly picked or she randomly picked a jar file from the internet 
downloaded that jar file used that jar file to develop a piece of code if that jar file is vulnerable that means it's opening up a lot of loopholes for the hackers to hack your into code then your entire project is compromised so this open source scanning for security what we will do is okay we will scan for all, all such jar files if there are any known vulnerabilities are there in either the code that you have developed or the libraries that you are using to develop that code okay so these scanners will scan each and every known vulnerability only by the way okay then you can ask me a question why they can't identify log4j even when they have all these scanners because it's not a known issue till that point now it is a known issue and it will be added to all the scanners now okay so first time you need to know this is an issue and then you will be able to appropriately scan for that for all the known issues so once it is done and then you will have a scanning report and if the scanning report is green then only you will be approving that particular project to go into production so that is the security aspects of it there are a lot of uh, tools like black duck uh, raven okay and you have fortify these are various tools that you can actually use okay to really do all this open source scanning okay and once the open source scanning is done then you will be able to uh, uh, send it to production okay so this also can be integrated into your entire continuous integration concept okay and uh, you, we can talk about any other additional stuff like serverless if you are using advanced concepts within aws like lambda where it's serverless now the now the latest thing is called function as a service okay you don't even need a server for that okay all these things are coming up so there are various tools that you will be learning okay but one of the most important tools is the continuous integration called jenkins okay so jenkins is the one which integrates all these tools we just talked about so then jenkins is like a normal thread that will actually combine all these things so once you have jenkins you can talk to git where you pull the code from that you can talk to maven where you build the code using maven and you do all the testing you deploy the code into tomcat and you can actually push the code into production also and you can integrate your sonar for source code scanning okay and you can integrate uh, uh, your actually uh, other stuff any other tool actually into this entire uh, jenkins ecosystem basically so that's uh, thing that would be so uh, in the interest of time what i'm going to do is i'll just show how a jenkins is going to look like how we can integrate all these tools together and in the actual session we'll go one tool at a time okay one tool at a time we'll learn and then probably we'll after three four tools we'll get into jenkins but normally you will be able to see okay so once you deploy jenkins okay on your um, uh, local host okay you will be able to see how uh, the jenkins dashboard and everything so let me see if my jenkins is up or down okay or am i using a different set, uh, host port number okay so my jenkins is an 8081 so uh, you will get to know okay uh, basically how you can install jenkins now and how you can configure the user ID and password. Okay, so this is basically what is called Jenkins dashboard. Okay, and for each of the project that you are managing, you will create something called a job. Okay, so if you look at this particular uh, uh, thing, okay, you can click or pick up on any job actually. So, for example, I am actually picking up, okay is my app and you can actually come and then create a new job like this okay from dashboards new item and you can you can start creating a new job this is already a created job i just want to do walk you all through this job so you can have configure on the left side so in the configuration you are going to basically configure the steps that you want to take okay the sequential steps that you want to take by the way the jenkins will give you all the default templates and all the sequence and everything by default okay for example you are going to talk about this particular project and the project management basically this is, so how many old builds you want to keep or where you want to store all the data and all these things you can define that and you just can give your git url so this is your github url so actually if you go and uh, look at this url this is where my code is on this particular github url this is where my source code is and jenkins is going to pick my source code dynamically from this url okay 
and then it will be able to run. And sometimes you can put a user ID and password for your code also. So you need to give that user ID and password here for your source code. And you can actually also specify in the code, you can actually do something called branching in Git actually. So either it can be a master branch, there can be a development branch or a release branch. So which branch that you want to pull the code from. So you need to specify that particular branch. So this Jenkins is going to pull all that code, put it in a folder, and how frequently it is going to pull. So there is actually this build triggers are when you want to build. Okay. So you can simply say I will just do it manually by uh, clicking a button. Or you can simply say do this build every night at 11 p.m. Or you can simply say do this build whenever there is some code that you want to change in my Git. So that is called polling, poll SCM. So here I am saying check every five minutes. Okay. And if there are any changes in the code, start the build. Okay. So this is what is called continuous integration. If you don't use this poll SCM feature, that means technically you are not doing continuous integration. So as we discussed in the uh, earlier, continuous integration is the moment somebody checks in the code, the entire process should start like building, packaging, deploying, all this stuff should go on without any disturbance. So the starting itself, you need to make sure it is starting dynamically. If there is any change, if there is no change, it will not start the build. Okay. So that's the advantage. So we will define the schedule here. It's like nothing but like a, if you are aware of Unix cron jobs, okay, uh, you can actually understand this or it will be easy that you will have all the help required here directly on Jenkins. Okay. Uh, now, so okay, we define what is the schedule or the trigger schedule that when and how it's going to trigger, right? Now then we'll we can actually define your build environment. Build environment in the sense sometimes you may need to supply some specific property values, or some additional property files, or some extra text that you wanted to do for your build. You can actually do that. Okay. And now you have the code from Git, you grab the code from Git. Now you need to build. So in order to build, you need to integrate with Maven. So here the integration of Maven is here. You can actually simply uh, mention what is the goal. Okay. So when we get into Maven, you will understand what are those goals and faces, which goal that you want to run. Are you want to do, are you just doing only package or you want to do deployment or you want to do installation of the uh, jar files. All these things will come into picture. You just need to mention that uh, goal and then you will be able to uh, just mention that M3. So M3 is basically where my Maven is sitting. So I can define the environment variables and I can just select this okay, and actually go from here. So now, and if there are any specific JVM options, like when you're building this, you want to allocate any extra memory to this process, like from your RAM and all, you can do this through JVM options. Okay. So once the build is done, you will be obviously getting an output as a war file. Okay. So you can actually see, okay. Uh, some of the war files that got built. Okay. Um, so like this, there will be a target folder and there will be a war file that will be built here. So once that entire build process is done and the Maven script is run, okay, you will get a war file like this. So once you have a war file, now the next job for you would be to deploy this onto Tomcat. Okay, so you definitely need to deploy for testing, right? So what you can do is you can install Tomcat. Okay, for example, you have your Tomcat on local 8080. Okay, so this is the port actually. I have. So if you go to this one, I don't think it is up, so it will be down. So but you can you know, start your Tomcat. Okay, so you have your Tomcat here, okay, and go to your bin folder, and there will be a script called startup. Okay, so you just start that script, and you will be able to see the Tomcat is coming up. Let's give it a minute. Uh, 
I think someone has a question about the course duration, right? We can wrap it up in 45 days, okay? And uh, there might be some hiccups here and there, like maybe one or two days if I'm uh, uh, skipping it or you're skipping it, maybe that depends on, but we can wrap it up in 45 days. Depends on how fast we can go or how slow we need to go. Is it 45 classes or uh, one and a half month? Yeah, we, we can actually have uh, one and a half month as overall duration, okay? okay? And each of these tools, you can actually go around two to three days, okay? And uh, sometimes, um, uh, for example, the previous batch, we spent more time on AWS because we had an issue with one of the connectivity, okay? Our uh, uh, Jenkins, we spent more time because they wanted to understand the concept deeper, okay? So like that, we can always adjust the timings. So is it a daily class, including Saturday, Sunday? It's only weekdays I'm uh, doing right now. Okay, Saturday, Sunday, uh, I'll see if I can actually do any uh, weekend, but not on a regular basis. Okay, so overall it is around uh, 35 classes? Yeah, 30, 35 classes. Okay. And it will start uh, strictly on time? Yeah, it will start six, strictly on time. Okay. 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. IST. So, so entire course uh, will be taught by you or uh, I mean any specific tools will be taught by some other okay. person. It's like only me. All the CACD, all, all, the tools, all the tools, whatever we discussed today will be taught by you only, right? Right. <laughs> okay, so, so I joined a few minutes later. Uh, may I know your good name, please? Nagabushan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nagabushan. Yeah. And uh, hi, this is Tikan. I have a quick question. Yes. So, is there any prerequisites uh, to start, you know, for DevOps to learning and yeah? Yes, like uh, the online websites and all. No, like you know, so like Java is mandatory to learn DevOps oh. or something. Okay, like prerequisites. You're asking about prerequisites. Yeah, yeah, prerequisites. So, yeah. It's not required actually, but if you have a Java development knowledge, it will be an advantage. Okay. So okay. then okay. Uh, you can actually understand the code that we are trying to deploy, the code we are trying to develop. Okay. But yeah, it's not a mandatory prerequisite. Okay. But if you have a good Java knowledge, it will be a very good advantage, uh, not only for you, for the entire class also, that you can explain if something is going wrong. Okay. 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 Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So Tomcat is up, okay. Uh, we brought it up and it's using 8080 port. Let's go back and then see if it is up. Something wrong. How much AWS stuff will be covered uh, here? Uh, AWS, I am not going to cover it as an AWS administrator solution architecture. AWS for DevOps only. So let's say you have a local instance, okay? And uh, instead of a local instance, you now want to develop or deploy on a cloud, okay? Which is AWS in this case. So how to create an EC2 instance? How to configure the EC2 instance, be it the security groups, firewalls, okay, any other stuff, and how you can actually install Tomcat on the instance. How can you deploy code onto that uh, Tomcat on the EC2 instance? So up to this only we'll cover, okay. <clears throat> going deep into all the AWS concepts, okay, like S3, Lambda, and all, we are not going to cover. So basically, this is only DevOps. That's yeah, only DevOps, right? Something wrong with my Tomcat instance. I may need to restart it again. Okay. Okay, but, but let's go to the Jenkins explanation while I fix that. Okay, so you have the Tomcat, you just need to give the Tomcat URL 
and of course you need to give tomcat user ID and password for this and you need to give a context path okay for that and whatever the war file here we said we mentioned star dot war because there is only one war file <clears throat> but if you have multiple war files you usually you will not have but in case there are multiple war files you need to be very specific on which war file that you want to deploy okay and that's it this is the job actually so once you create this job so it is going to take care of all the uh, features okay that happened and if you look at one of the job outputs basically and build output okay and look at this console output okay and this is going to give you a clear view of how it started grab grabbing the code from git and how maven has built that code and finally created this war file okay this is where the war file is my app dot war file and finally how it got deployed onto your tomcat here deploy publisher okay so all the steps are taken care and you can also look at various other uh, stuff so for example there is a concept called pipeline in uh, uh, jenkins okay so you can look at that uh, pipeline as uh, basically a, like this so for example whatever we have seen in the uh, console output you will be able to visualize if you use the pipeline concept you will be able to visualize okay which step got failed okay and what is the reason logs and everything so it will actually give you that uh, good uh, visualization of the same steps okay rather than going through the entire log you can see here simply in a graphical way okay. this is what uh, another uh, feature of uh, jenkins actually the pipeline concept okay. and another thing we can also integrate uh, your sonar and test results and everything into your job okay so uh, for example if you see here this job has more details around okay you, it has all the j unit test results and everything here in this particular graph and you can also integrate your sonar cube and uh, you will be able to see all the sonar uh, uh, test results everything sonar is down right now so that's why it's not able to access that okay but if your sonar is up then it will be able to do all the like i i mentioned about the open source uh, source code scanning right all those results also will come here okay and you can see for this particular project for this build scanning is good or not unit testing are good is uh, good or not okay so that's about uh, the jenkins uh, uh, stuff and so basically jenkins is going to be that one integrated tool okay where we can use any tool and then actually able to uh, put this into the entire pipeline so any questions i will pause here okay i think we uh, spent almost an hour i will pause and if there are any questions from any one of you i am happy to answer Gaganeshri here actually uh, for all the tools uh, it, it is paid or uh, we need to down we can download it like that only all are actually open so some of the tools are actually you need a license but majority of the tools and especially what we can use for practice you can download and then uh, uh, there are there are some trial versions also okay you can okay. use it okay. only for aws you need to put your credit card information there will be two rupees that will be cut, uh, 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 taken from your credit card okay you need to save that information not to use it, aws but it will not be charged up to 750 hours up to 750 hours you will not be charged okay okay yeah that's the one thing that's a catch the rest all are open source thank you yeah, no problem any other questions from anyone Okay, if we don't have any questions, thanks to everyone for joining. Okay, and uh, we'll wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.